Okay, as you guys know, I love typology. I love, love, love typology, but it's potentially really dangerous, and I think it'd be irresponsible of me if I didn't, in this long series on Jesus in the Old Testament, if I didn't just take at least one message and just deal with the dangers of typology. So that's what we're going to do today, because some people radically abuse typology to spread false teachings. They use it to manipulate and deceive people so that people think something's biblical when it's not. And that's, that's what I wanted to deal with today. I don't know if you've noticed, but I try to have careful protections as I'm finding a type in the Old Testament, uh, you know, and sharing it with you as to what it might be or how that relates to Christ. I have careful protections, but here's how this happens, how typology is abused. That's what we're going to focus on today. In particular, we're going to talk about the Catholic Church because I think they're not someone I want to pick on. But when it comes to Mariology, that's the best example of abusing typology that I've ever seen is in the specific teachings about Mary. So we'll get into that today. Here's how it happens, right? Um, when your church or the group that you're involved with has teachings that everyone in your group accepts, but one day you ask, how do I find that in the Bible? And then you start looking and searching and you go, I, I can't find this in the Bible. I'm starting to worry that this teaching may not be biblical, may not be true. But you know, false use of typology rescues them by going into the text and saying, well, it's not clearly taught in scripture, but it's pictured there. And it's not that hard to find a picture of whatever you want and to then use it to reinforce what ends up being a false teaching and then lets your people think they're being biblical when they're not. And that's what we're going to talk about. Um, so I have three rules that I'm going to mention first. These are three rules I use when I'm trying to do typology or find Jesus in the Old Testament. And the first rule is this, and I mentioned it several times, so I know you already know it. It's no new theology. That's my first rule. It's like, I'm not coming up with any new teachings. There's no new theology. It's not like some new revelation that I'm getting when I look at a picture in the Old Testament. See, typology starts with theology and then looks for something in the Old Testament that might reflect that theology in a picture form. It starts with the New Testament clear teachings and looks for Old Testament pictures. We do not start with extra biblical teachings and then try to force that onto the text of scripture. That would be by nature, not part of the Bible. That's not part of the biblical revelation. See, scripture is a completed revelation. Old to New Testament, this is a completed revelation. That's why Jude, in Jude 3, it says uh, that we're to contend earnestly for the faith that was once for all delivered, past tense, to the saints. And the faith is the things we believe. So I'm to contend or fight, not physically, but fight for the faith that was once for all delivered, past tense, to the saints. Like if, if it's not here, if it's not part of that ancient record, then it wasn't part of what was delivered. So don't try to force something into it. In 1 Timothy 1.3, Paul tells Timothy that he charges Timothy that that Timothy would go and charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. So just nothing different. Nothing different than what they've already been taught. So unless it's apostolic, unless it's ancient, unless it's really recorded in our New Testament, which is our only true record of first century apostolic teachings, right there, unless it's that, then we're not going to try to smash it into the Bible and use typology as an excuse. If I can only find a doctrine in pictures and I can't find it in clear teachings, what does that mean? It's not a biblical doctrine. You're just finding analogies for it. You're not actually finding it. That's the problem. So my first rule is no new theology. My second rule as I do typology, and I encourage us all to have this rule, is Jesus is the center of typology. It's all about Jesus Christ. <clears throat> John 5.46, Jesus says, If you believe Moses, you will believe me, for he wrote of me. He wrote of Jesus. Moses wrote of Jesus. Revelation 19.10, the angel says to John, that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. It's like the heart of the whole thing. It's all about Christ. In fact, part one in this series on typology, if you want to look at that, that's got, we did a whole thing on how we established the existence of typology and that it's all about Jesus. Jesus is the one we have the liberty to speculate about because we already know there's dozens and dozens of types specifically told from the New Testament that tell us that was Jesus. Jesus himself, he's like the bronze serpent, yeah. Like Moses of the bronze serpent, so me. So like Jonah in the belly of the fish, so me. And so he relates it to himself. <clears throat> That's clear. Mariology, on the other hand, is, is one example that violates this because there's no clear New Testament teaching that gives you any types of Mary. Not that I'd be bothered if it did. I'd be like, That's cool, right? Like, just any Catholics who may watch this, 
we love Mary. <laughs> we, nothing against Mary. There's no hatred for Mary here. Mary is super blessed. But in the same sense as <clears throat> Moses, he gave them the bronze serpent, right? Generations later, they started worshiping the bronze serpent. And so then they just, it was destroyed. It became an idol. And so God indefinitely, you know, he used Mary in this wonderful way, blessed among women and all this sort of thing. But generations later, they started to lift her up as an idol, basically. And so they started adding more than what was originally there. And that's, that's a problem. So number three, the, the third rule. So the first one's no new theology. Second is Jesus is the center. And the third one is the Bible guides us in identifying types in the first place. So I'm not just like willy-nilly, just totally making stuff up. The Bible guides us. Now, I've done this in this series. I've tried to identify just about every type I've given, except for maybe a couple examples. Uh, we actually have a specific New Testament teaching that gives us a reason to find that type. And then we go to it and we look for more details. Um, so we have 14 hours of it so far. This is the 15th session in this series. Finally, after you do like the clear types, you can enjoy some conjecture about some stuff that may not be clear. But you use the clear ones to help you find the not clear ones because you figure God's going to be consistent in the way he does typology. And so that's, that's again, the, the third rule. The Bible guides us in identifying types. So if I don't see this type, then I'm going to hold it much more loosely because the New Testament's not giving it to me clearly. I'll hold it more carefully, more loosely. And again, no new teaching is getting established here. I'm just making connections between the New Testament teachings and Old Testament pictures. That's what I'm doing. I'm not creating new theology. So let me give you really quick, um, as our example here, again, I'm not trying to pick on Catholicism. It's going to sound that way to some people. I really don't mean it that way. I love Catholics, and for that reason, actually, it's one reason why I want to do this, <laughs> is to try to help. Um, there's four Marian dogmas. Now, a dogma, according to the Catholic Church, is something you have to believe in order to be saved. Like it's, a, it's if you Now, I reject these, these Marian dogmas. Now, because I reject it, knowing about them and intentionally rejecting them, that's considered a mortal sin in Catholicism. So I'm, I'm condemned to hell. That's traditional Catholic views. There are some, you know, like Pope Francis today, he probably would not agree with that. But I don't think he agrees with a lot of Catholic theology, actually. I think there's a really weird thing going on with the Pope nowadays. Um, but here's the four dogmas. Now, there's other doctrines about Mary that they teach, but you don't have to accept. But here's the four dogmas you have to accept. The first one is that Mary, it, the immaculate conception of Mary. And you might be thinking, oh, you mean the virgin birth? No, 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 no. This is not about Jesus. This is about Mary. The idea is that Mary was conceived and born with no sin. And Mary lived her whole life without sinning. That's the idea. She never sinned. She, now, they'll, they'll say, oh, we're not saying that she doesn't need Jesus' grace. Because they'll say Jesus is, Jesus is the one who made her without sin. And they'll often say things like, well, if you could make your mother without sin, wouldn't you? Except that's not how we make theology, right? Like, we don't just go, wouldn't you? And therefore, it's true theologically. Like, that's not how we do it. But Immaculate Conception, she was born and stayed throughout her life without sin. She never sinned. The second one is the perpetual virginity of Mary. We believe that Mary was a virgin at the conception of Jesus Christ, right? At the birth of Jesus Christ, she had never been with a man. But their belief is that she continued to be a virgin throughout her entire life and, um, Therefore, the brothers and sisters, and that's a whole different video, a whole different topic, and I'm not going to get into that, but that's the belief, right? Therefore, those are cousins and not really relatives. And Joseph and Mary were never together. Um, so that's the perpetual virginity of Mary. And then number three, the divine maternity of Mary, or the phrase, Mary is the mother of God. That's the terminology used. The terminology itself isn't so terrible, actually, because it's actually about Jesus. It's about who is Jesus. Jesus is God. In one sense... As a non-Catholic, I could say Mary's the mother of God, isn't the sense that Jesus is God. But what they're saying is that she has a special role that continues as the, as the divine mother. She's in a motherly role forever, and she intercedes for you, and you can pray to Mary, and she can go to Jesus being his mom, and she can still intercede. And we'll get into that in a second. So number four, the fourth one, the glorious assumption. And this is something you have to believe that Mary either when she died or she never died, there's Catholics on both sides of that issue, but that she was bodily taken up into heaven. She didn't, you know, her tomb was found empty also along with Jesus's, right? So she was taken up into heaven. That's the belief about the assumption of Mary. Now converts to Catholicism, people especially who leave, say, a Bible teaching environment and they become Catholics, they often struggle and they're like, oh, you know, I'm, I'll accept, you know, Catholicism, but I have a hard time with these Marian doctrines dogmas because I can't find them in the Bible. And this 
is a regular issue. And then on Catholic Answers and programs where you can call in and talk to Catholic apologists, they're constantly getting questions about these sorts of things. So they found ways of defending these Marian doctrines and dogmas, and the way they do it is with typology. And they say, ah, maybe, maybe it's not clearly taught in the New Testament, but it's pictured in the Old, and therefore it's true. So we're going to unpack that. Um, let me, let me uh, we're going to play clip number one, so get that ready. But this is a gentleman named Scott Hahn. Scott Hahn is a Catholic apologist. The video I got this clip from has like over 200,000 views. He goes around defending Catholicism. He used to be uh, uh, non-Catholic, and now he's Catholic. He says he used to be anti-Catholic. I've never been that. <laughs> but, but, but it seems like all the converts always talk about how hateful they were of Catholics. And I was like, well, maybe that was a problem. But um, yeah, we're not on that page. Uh, we love Catholics. We just think that the theology of Catholicism is wrong. But... But this is what he says about when he felt trepidation and he was bothered because when he was a new convert, he couldn't find Mariology in the Bible. So here was his solution. Let's play that clip. I'd like to share with you how I found the Blessed Virgin Mary in Scripture. Typology. Now, typology is the thing. I'll play some more clips from him. Uh, typology is the thing. This is how they get these theologies from typology. That's already violating our first rule. Right? Because typology is saying, God, you revealed this in the New Testament. Now I'm looking for a picture. Rather, the, the Catholic approach to Mariology is to say, it's not in the New Testament. Let's just go dig up a picture for it to justify our belief in this thing. And that's a problem. So let's share with you three examples of this typology. We'll play clip two. This is what he says and how he gets doctrines about Mary from pictures supposedly of Mary in the Old Testament. Now you might be thinking, how does this apply to Mary? Quite simply, you see, if Jesus is the new Adam, Mary is the new Eve. If Jesus is the new Moses, then Mary is the Ark of the New Covenant. If Jesus is a new Solomon, the son of David, then Mary is the Queen Mother of the son of David. The new is prefigured by the old, and the old is fulfilled in the new. And you can see why I'm concerned in doing a series on typology that I might, in my, if I don't cover this, I might open the door for this sort of thinking to people. So let's deal with it very plainly, right? He gives three types, and this is very normal. This is normal Catholic teaching here. This is not like Scott Hahn's not on his own here. This is the standard line for how they deal with these issues. When he says that Mary's the new Eve, he uses the new Eve to bring in the doctrine of immaculate conception. Eve was born without sin, therefore Mary is born without sin. When he says that Mary is the new ark, they use this to bring in the, the dogmas of um, uh, perpetual virginity, that she, she remained a virgin, I'll explain how in a minute, and also the bodily assumption. They use this analogy about the ark to say, see, that proves Mary was assumed and a perpetual virgin. Then when he says that she's the queen mother, he uses this to bring out the divine maternity and her ability to intercede for us so you can pray to Mary and she can go to Jesus on your behalf because she's the queen mother. So it's really, now most of you guys are with me, right? That's sketchy. Like you just made up theology out of a picture that you, you say you found, but let's analyze these pictures more carefully. So let's, first we'll talk about New Eve. Is Mary the New Eve? Well, here's how they sell it. They sell it like this, or explain it like this. They say that Jesus is the new Adam, Mary's the new Eve, and they say Jesus supposedly said this in John chapter two, that Jesus, gave us this type in John chapter 2. And it's in John 2, 4. There they are at the wedding at Cana of Galilee in John chapter 2, verse 4. And Jesus said to her, woman, woman, that one word is going to be the key here. Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour is not yet come. Now, Jesus, when he says to her, woman, this is a special term referring to her as an equal because this is a special word. There's a lot of Greek mumbo jumbo that comes out when I dig into sometimes Catholic apologetics. But there's a special Greek word that means equality, and he's elevating her position. And then later on, in John 19, 26, he speaks to her again. One to the beginning of his ministry, where he's turning water to wine, you know? And then at the end of his ministry, when he's on the cross, he says to her again in John 19, 26, um, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Woman, behold your son. And that's that word woman again, so he's elevating her again. And uh, then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. And that's also not when they do typology, but when they just say, behold your mother, they're saying she's the mother of all, of all Christians based upon that phrase with John, which there's several problems with that. Um, 
but that's a different video. I don't want to get into that topic right now. I want to talk about the typology. So first there's this. The, the word used in John 2.4 and John 19.26, they make a lot of this. I've heard it from multiple different Catholic apologists. It's the word gunai. Do um, you guys want to know what gunai means? Woman. Is it special? No. Is it normal? Yes. It's like the English word woman. It's just normal. You just say it when you're talking to females. This was the normal. And did Jesus even use it in a special way? No, not even in the gospel of John did Jesus use this in a special way. In John 4, verse 21, he's talking to the woman at the well. And it says, Jesus said to her, woman, gunai, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the father. So Jesus talks to the woman at the well. Is he elevating her in some sense? Is he putting her down? No, he's just talking to her. It was a normal, appropriate way of addressing a female. That was just what it was. In John 20, 15, after he says, woman, behold your son to Mary, in John 20, 15, Jesus says to a different Mary who's there weeping at the tomb, woman, why are you weeping? Whom do you seek? Supposing him to be the gardener, she says, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and I will take him away. So he referred, this is, in other words, this is just how Jesus talked to ladies. Now, sometimes in English, if you call a lady, woman, hey, woman, it actually comes off like it's an insult. That's not what's happening here. It's not an insult. It's just a normal, appropriate form of address for a lady. That's all. So they make a lot out of this. Can you, can you, I don't even, unless you hear them say it, you don't even know how, how did you get the new Eve out of Jesus saying woman? Plus he says it to other ladies too. And they're not elevated in it or changed in any sense because of it. This seems really strange. But there's more to it. And so I'm going to play a clip in a second of, of how he does this. But there's some juggling that goes on here. And what he does is he says in John 1, other Catholics do this too, but Scott Hahn kind of stands as representative of it. They say that there's these seven days of creation thematically in, in John 1 and John 2. And the moment when Jesus says, woman, you know, what does your concern have to do with me? When he says that, it's at the seventh day of, the seventh day of creation, which symbolizes Adam and Eve and Eve, Adam naming Eve woman, according to Scott, on the seventh day. So let's listen to this clip and then we'll unpack it and explain all the things that are wrong with it. So let's go ahead and play it. In John 2, verse 1, we read, on the third day, there was a marriage at Cana in Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. So what does John mean when he says, on the third day there was a marriage at Cana? So the next day, the first time would be day two. The next day, the second time would be day three. The next day, the third time would be day four. On the third day would bring us suddenly to the seventh day. And what happened in Genesis 1 and 2? On day six, God made man, male, and then female. And in Genesis 2, we discover he wakes up the morning of the seventh day, and what does he spy? Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, and he says, woman. And so there on the seventh day is the sign of a marriage covenant between the first Adam and the first Eve. So what did the early church fathers discover in John 1 and 2? In the beginning was the word, light, darkness, life, creation, all of that. The next day, the next day, the next day, day four, the third day, leading us up to day seven, and there's this beautiful marriage, a wedding at Cana in Galilee. What is the first thing that Jesus says to his mother? Woman, what have you to do with me? That is a euphemism, an idiomatic expression in the Greek and the Hebrew, implying no disrespect whatsoever. In fact, it implies mutuality. So here on day seven, the new Adam coming to redeem the old creation that the first Adam had plunged into ruin. And along with the new Adam comes a new Eve. And along with the new Adam and the new Eve comes a mystical marriage, a mystical covenant, the new covenant. And on that occasion, he turns water into wine. This was the first sign to reveal his glory. Okay, so... <clears throat> this is the this is the reasoning. Now, let me just start by saying this. Is that clear Bible teaching that you just heard? It's huge leaps based on implications of adding up numbers and twisting the actual original Genesis story. Along with like I mean I read Genesis or uh, John 2 and I don't see an Adam theme for Jesus in this passage. 
So why would I even look for an Eve theme for anybody else? It's not, it's just not there. But let me talk about the issues. Okay, so John 1 does have a creation motif, but it's earlier in John 1. It's not later in John 1, right? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, right? All things were made through him. And it talks about light and all. So there is, is a creation motif, but then it just goes into story. The story, the actual history of John the Baptist. So in John 1, 29, 135 and 143, we have these next day phrases. And he tries to say that these are all part of a creation motif in John 1 and John 2. Here's the problem. When you actually look at them and you say, well, if the seventh day is somehow a creation motif, then I expect all the other days to be related too, right? To creation somehow. But if you actually just read the passage, which is a lot for us to read today, so I'm just going to skim through it. But um, okay. But for, first follow this. He says after the next day, next day, next day, he says the third day of John 2, 1 is, is actually the seventh day symbolizing God making Adam and Eve. And then Adam wakes up and he sees Eve and calls her woman on day seven, according to Scott Hahn. What does Genesis say? Day six. Why does Scott Hahn change it and make and act like it says day seven? Because he needs it to say that because when he added up the days in John, it was day seven. It doesn't fit the motif, but he's just going to say it. He does that a couple times where he just honestly twists the scripture. Um, maybe on purpose, maybe not. Uh, I don't know. I'm not going to worry about judging his heart, but I will judge his words. And his words are not biblical. So in John uh, chapter 1, verse 19 through 28, we get the first day in this, what Scott Hahn thinks is a creation motif, right? In day one, the, the religious leaders question John and he tells of the one coming after him, which is going to be Jesus Christ. How is that related to creation? I have no idea. Neither does anybody else. In John 1, 29, we have the phrase the next day. So here's day two. And from 29 to 34, we have John the Baptist. He identifies Jesus as the one. He's like, behold, the Lamb of God. This is the guy I was telling you about. That's on the next day. How is that related to creation? I don't know. Neither does anybody else. In the next one, John 1, 35 to 42, that's day three. It says the next day again. And now Andrew and Simon, they go on to follow Jesus. The two of his disciples have been recruited now on the third day. How does that relate? I don't know. How does that relate to creation? Like, where, where's the creation motif? It's not. It's in John 1, early part of the book. It's not here. Then in John uh, 1, 43, we have the fourth day. For, that's where it says the next day again. And now we have Philip and Nathaniel. They join Jesus. And so now two more of the disciples have joined Jesus. How does that relate to creation? It doesn't. In John 2, 1, it says, and then on the third day. And there's a debate. Is that three days after the previous event in John? And that's how long it took them to go to Galilee from where John was to, to get to Galilee, to Cana, where this wedding was? Or is it just like the, it was in the wedding and it was the third day of the week? There's a debate on that. Um, their theology needs it to be one thing. Maybe they're right on that. I don't know. But it just says on the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus was also invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour is not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. And he sees this as clear, clear indication, right? Jesus is the new Adam. Eve, uh, Mary is the new Eve. And there's like a marriage covenant going on between Jesus and his mom. This is weird. But this is, this is what happens when you're forced to find your theology in pictures. So you use pictures that you create, fabricate in the New Testament, and then you use pictures that you, you just force onto the Old Testament. There's a lot of problems with this, right? Adam, for, first off, he didn't wake up on the seventh day to see Eve. That's completely fabricated. That's not what Genesis reads. God made Adam and Eve, both of them, on the sixth day, according to the creation account. So they were made on day six, end of story. Day seven, nothing else was made, right? Adam uh, experienced all those things on day six is the idea. Uh, he just changes it because he has to make it fit somehow. So it's also far too vague. And here you are, you're arguing from pictures to pictures. Like, that's not how we do theology, right? Like, I don't have to do this with the Trinity, right? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Like, that's not just a picture. Like, this is the only way to understand this is the Trinity. Um, it's forced upon us. So Scott Hahn also talks about Eve and the curse of Mary, um, Eve and the curse of Mary. In Genesis 3, according to, to Scott Hahn, Eve and her seed, quote, Eve and her seed will crush the head of the serpent. So this is the clip we played it. I played it by mistake earlier. I didn't specify. But let's play it one more time in case anybody missed it. Catch, see if beyond the big words that he uses, 
if you can catch the actual reasoning he's using because he's a big beefy speaker but to me that's not persuasive like i want to hear the reasons you know so let's listen to that that when biblical scholars apply themselves to the terminology and the imagery in genesis 3:15 where the woman and her seed shall crush the head of the serpent biblical scholars have come away looking at that in its ancient historical light and they see quote the woman of Genesis 3.15 is a prototypical queen mother figure. Where Eve failed, a new Eve will succeed. Where the first queen mother sinned, a new queen mother will arise in righteousness. He quotes authors Cazell, Robert Fouillet, Laurentin Stuhlmuller, and many others. No doubt the queen mother has her place here in Genesis 3.15. She is clearly the queen mother from whom royal offspring will arise to crush the serpent's head. So what we find in the Davidic kingdom is the restoration of what God established in the creation kingdom way back in the beginning. I know some of you caught it where he actually just changed the Bible. Genesis 3.15 does not say that the woman and her seed will crush the head of the serpent. Why do you think he would change it to say that? Because he's trying to smuggle in new theology. So he just changes it. This is abuse of the text. Like, I'm not honoring God's word. Genesis 3.15, he says, I will put enmity between you, God speaking to the serpent, between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring, he, the offspring, shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Not he and her. It's a single agent acting to, to destroy the serpent. That's the prophecy. And this isn't even a picture. This is a prophecy. Pictures and prophecies are not the same thing. Um, it's one agent acting. It's not the woman in the seed. And honestly, I find this shocking. But the reason why he smuggled that terminology in there, why he changed the wording there, which who knows who in the audience there even noticed it when he was teaching it. Um, the reason why he did that is because they're also, now it's not, a, it's not a dogma, but it's a doctrine they're teaching, and many Catholics want it to be a dogma, that Mary is co-redemptrix, that she actually is one of the ones who helped redeem us and participated in, in redeeming us, not Jesus alone, but Mary. And so that terminology comes from that, that push for that new dogma that they really would like to have, some of them would like to have. So what theology did they get from this uh, analogy of G, uh, Adam as the new uh, or Jesus is the new Adam and, and Mary is the new Eve. They say that Mary was therefore without original sin because Eve was made without sin, right? They were made sinless. Therefore, Mary was made without sin. And, there, and she stays that way and she never sins because just as Eve disobeyed God, Mary obeyed God. You know, Eve was told, don't eat of the, free. Mary, out of the tree. Mary was told, um, you're going you're gonna to be with child of the Holy Spirit and she, she delighted in it. And so she had the response of faith. And... Um, and then they'll even, some of them would even say that Mary doesn't die as a result of this, because just like Eve died, so Mary doesn't die. But it's just smuggling theology into places it doesn't belong. Does the New Testament tell us who Eve might foreshadow? Is it Mary? There is this great picture between Adam and Eve about the husband and a bride. And at, Jesus is clearly the, the new Adam. Who is Jesus' bride? Is it Mary? As, as weird as that is even to think about, no, it's the church. The church is the bride of Christ. And I have scripture for this, clear scripture, not pictures, teachings, like clear teachings. Ephesians 5, the husband is to love his wife and give himself for her just as Christ loved the church. He talks about marriage and at the end of it, he goes, this is a profound mystery, but I speak to you concerning Christ and the church. That husband and wife is a picture of Jesus and the church. That's the idea. That Adam and Eve, the picture of husband and wife, is a picture of Christ and his church. In 2 Corinthians 11.12, he says, I feel divine jealousy for you, since I betrothed, 11.2, excuse me, I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. Now, being presented as a pure virgin to Christ, if you're coming from the Catholic mindset, you're thinking that's got to be Mary. But the text is clear. This is about the church. Revelation 19 and Revelation 21 talk about the final marriage between the bride and and the, which is the church and Jesus that has finally come. And consistently throughout the New Testament, the bride is the church, not Mary. Um, if there is typology of Mary, even if you could say Mary was somehow this new Eve, how does that get you the theology that they're giving us? 
Like, even if they did correctly identify the type, I, I'm not opposed to there being a typology of Mary. I mean, Mary's kind of important. It's kind of a big deal. She's definitely prophesied in Isaiah, right? The virgin shall conceive. So there's, I wouldn't be, have a problem with that. The problem is when you try to create theology out of that. So Jesus is considered, here's our second example of typology. Jesus is considered the new Moses, and therefore Mary is the new Ark of the Covenant, right? The Ark of the New Covenant is, I think, how he put it. I uh, found an, uh, an article on National Catholic Register, which is a, a website um, where they promote uh, Catholic teachings and, and, and doctrines and things like that. And it, the title of the article was Amazing Parallels Between Mary and the Ark of the Covenant. So they're trying to draw parallels between the Ark. We, we just did last time we did the, the temple and how the Ark all represents Christ. They're saying that that's really about Mary. Now you might ask, how do you find that in the New Testament? And they find it in Luke one thirty five. Luke 135. In Luke 135, it says, And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. That word overshadow is episkiazo, at least that's that's the lexical form of the, of the word. Um, episkiase is another way to put it. But here's what the National Catholic Register, their website, said about this word and how they use it to say that this proves this the holy spirit will overshadow you proves that she is the new ark they say and i quote the greek word for overshadow is episkiase which describes a bright glorious cloud notice their description of this greek word it describes a bright glorious cloud it is used with reference to the cloud of transfiguration of jesus in matthew 17 5 mark 9 7 and luke 9 34 and also has connection to the shekinah glory of god exodus 24 40 and first kings chapter 8. Um, but if you actually look up this word episkiazo or episkiase in a greek dictionary you find out that it doesn't mean anything bright or glorious do you know what it means Write, write this down. This is important, right? Because you're going to find when you look up Greek words, it, you, they usually mean the same thing as they were already translated to mean in your Bibles. It means overshadow. That's all it means. They're just, it's just Greek gobbledygook. It's gobbledygreek is what it is. This is not, people try to sometimes manipulate others saying, oh, in the Greek, there's a special thing here. And usually that's not the case. For instance, the same author of Luke 135, the same guy wrote the book of Acts, right? Luke wrote Acts as well. And in Acts 5.15, he uses the exact same word. And he's talking about Peter and how Peter was traveling. And they wanted Peter's shadow to fall on them that they might be healed. Let me read the passage and ask yourself if you think this means a, quote, um, bright, glorious cloud. So... Acts 5.15, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. Obviously, Peter is being followed by a bright and glorious cloud. No, that's just not what it means. Like, this is just, it's, it's not true. It's just not true. But from that word, overshadow, they say that relates to the, to the tabernacle. By the way, the word, that word is never used uh, related to the tabernacle in the Septuagint, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament. I looked for it. I can't find it. Um, it's, it's other words that are used. Um, uh, I won't get into all the details there, but, but basically, this is fabricated. This is a fabricated connection. It's not established in the text. Um, but then the same article goes on to list four connections between the Ark and Mary to try to establish that she really is a picture. The Ark is a picture of Mary. So I'll give the four connections. And they're all from 2 Samuel 6 and Luke chapter 1. So Luke chapter 1, 2 Samuel 6, these two looked at together are supposed to give us the idea that Mary is this, um, uh, this Ark of the Covenant. So in 2 Samuel 6, 9, when the Ark is coming to David and he's receiving it after he's become king, he's very happy, right? He's very excited about the Ark. And it says <clears throat> in chapter 6, verse 9 of 2 Samuel, And David was afraid of the Lord that day, and he said, How can the Ark of the Lord come to me? Now parallel that to what happened when Elizabeth found out that Mary was coming to her in Luke chapter 1, verse 43. Elizabeth, as Mary's pregnant, Elizabeth says, And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And it's the phrase come to me that's highlighted here. Right? David's like, how could the ark of the Lord come to me? And Elizabeth says, how could the mother of my Lord come to me? Mother of the Lord, ark of the Lord, she's the ark. Right? The ark's a container. She's containing Jesus Christ. Right? The, the, all the things that were in the ark represented Jesus. She's holding Jesus. This is the idea. The problem is, 
2 Samuel in context doesn't look like a very good picture. The reason why, why, why David says this, how can the ark come to me, is because Uzzah just touched the ark and was slain. And David's, David's not welcoming the ark. He's rejecting it now. He's not like Elizabeth. Oh, this is so wonderful. No, he's like, no, it can't come to me. And he doesn't accept it into his home or into his palace or into anywhere he wanted it to go. Let me read it to you in, in context. 2 Samuel 6, verses 5 through 11. Let's read the whole passage. Because if, if we have a consistent type, it should have, as I've said before, multiple points of correspondence that are consistent, if we're going to call it a type. So 2 Samuel 6, 5, And David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with songs and lyres and harps. Lyres, the lyres, the, the instrument, not like people telling lies. That would be a weird way to celebrate. And harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. And when they had come to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah and God struck him down there because of his error and he died there because the ark, because the ark of God. And David was angry because the, the Lord had broken out against Uzzah and that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? And let's just keep reading the next verse. So David was not willing to take the ark of the Lord into the city of David. And but is that parallel with Elizabeth somehow? How can you come to me? You can't. Go away. Like, she, he doesn't, she doesn't reject Mary. That The connection doesn't, doesn't hold. But David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. Now, if Elizabeth had housed Mary in somebody else's house, maybe it would be a better case for a connection there. Um, and the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. So what's the connection between Mary and Elizabeth? It's literally just the phrase, come to me. That's the whole connection. There's a second connection that they'll try to give. Um, by the way, when Jesus came to John to be baptized, what did John say? In Matthew 3, 14, John says, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? So here's a come to me passage that's not, and Mary's not there. So I don't know what they do with that one. Um, number two, the second connection that this website gives is that Elizabeth was loud, and the people of God were loud when the ark came. And there's these two verses. So 2 Samuel 6, 15. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the horn. And then Luke 142, Elizabeth, she exclaimed with a loud cry, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. There's a problem with this. For one, it's just loudness. That's not really all that specific. I feel like we need a lot more points of compatibility to call it a type. I wouldn't care if it was a type. If Mary's going to be the ark, fine, Lord, you can make her the ark. It doesn't mean she's born without sin and she is physically assumed into heaven. Like that's just wrong. But this is actually three months later now. So what we want to do is parallel David greeting the ark with Elizabeth's greeting of Mary, except what in the parallel, they're bouncing around the timeline of 2 Samuel 6. So at first, it's David rejecting the ark. And then three months later, he goes, okay, let's bring the ark back. Let's, let's make sacrifices and bring the ark in. That's when they're shouting. And, that, and Elizabeth, she greeted her at the first time. So, and there was no blessing. It was just loudness. It's just paralleling loudness, which seems a little weak to me. And then the third connection is leaping. <clears throat> leaping. In 2 Samuel 6, 14, when three months after Uzzah, then they bring the ark in, and David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David was girded with a linen ephod. King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. That's also 1 Chronicles 15, 29. So um, we have him dancing in 2 Samuel. In 1 Chronicles, we have the word leaping specifically. Luke 1, 44, here's what Elizabeth says. For behold, when the voice of your greeting came to my ears, the babe in my womb leaped for joy. So this is, again, three months later. These are two separate events. And they're trying to smash them together to create a type. <clears throat> but the dancing is not Elizabeth, is it? If Elizabeth's supposed to be David, then why is John dancing? Is John David? Well, then Elizabeth was the one shouting and saying, come to me. So this, this, the whole type is just kind of, kind of like patchwork smashed together. It's not really how we like to do this sort of thing. And then the fourth connection, the final connection that they say, these are remarkable connections, best examples of how Mary's the Ark of the New Covenant, <clears throat> is the, the term three months. So 2 Samuel 6, 10, so David was not willing to take the Ark of the Lord into the city of David, but David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite, and the Ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite three months. Now, of course, all the other parallels, or parallels two and three, the second and third one, they come after all this. But they're saying that it's just all mishmashed. Um, Luke 139, um, 
Actually, Luke 156. So Mary remained with her about three months and then returned to her home. So Mary stayed with Elizabeth for three months. So there's a three-month connection between the two passages. Here's my problem. First, Elizabeth is David. David. Then Elizabeth is all Israel, shouting. Then she's David again in the third example, um, or the second example, I should say. Then John is David when he's leaping. Then Elizabeth is Obed-Edom when she's bringing the ark to her house, because that's where he, the ark stayed, was Obed-Edom's house, not David's house. Um, so it's, it just doesn't make sense. Like the type doesn't hold together very well. It's not well constructed. But even if it was, it doesn't give you the theology they get. Listen to this. Here's a quote from that same article on uh, ncregister.com. Thus, by analogy, it was fitting and proper for Mary, the Ark of the New Covenant, Theotokos, bearer of God, who had the sublime honor of carrying God incarnate in her womb to be exceptionally perfect, exceptionally perfectly holy. All of this gymnastics is done to say that Mary is holy and sinless. That's the idea. She's, she's without sin. She's without sin. This is how they get theology from this. Another um, article on catholic.com, called, um, uh, which I'll quote. Uh, actually, I've been quoting from the same article, catholic.com. There's NC Register. I'll put the links in the video description for people who want to look at this stuff. But here's this, this article. They quote it like this. They say, God was very specific about every exact detail of the ark. I, we all agree there, right? It was a place where God himself would dwell. God wanted his words inscribed on stone, housed in a perfect container covered with pure gold within and without. How much more would he want his word Jesus to have a perfect dwelling place? If the only begotten son were, ta- were to take up residence in the womb of a human girl, would he not make her flawless? Right? Like, wouldn't he? That's not how we do theology. Like, if God loves everybody, won't he save everybody? I mean, wouldn't he? Like, that's not how you do theology, guys. Like, that's reckless and dangerous theology. So it doesn't argue for New Testament truth. It just starts with Catholic theology and tries to push it into patchwork pictures in the Old Testament. So here's some problems. Um, The ark is actually not filled with God. Where was the presence of God in the temple or the tabernacle? Above the ark, outside of it, in between the cherubim who had their wings outstretched. So the ark is not filled with the presence of God. That's not the case. The tabernacle, in the very passages they quote, I won't read them to you for the sake of time, but in the Ezekiel, and, or sorry, Exodus uh, in particular, the tabernacle gets this cloud covering it, but not specifically the ark. So they're saying she's the ark, but it's the tabernacle that has the covering, not specifically the ark. Um, and the tabernacle, as we understand, represents Christ. The tabernacle was the dwelling, um, not the ark. God's spirit was above and outside of the ark. It was behind the veil. It was not under the lid. There's a bit, just a difference there. And this breaks the picture apart for us. Mary's never called the ark in the New Testament, not even once at any point, which would be interesting if she was. Then we could look at these pictures, you know. And this, of course, creates new theology. Um, one Catholic apologist in a debate I saw on the Marian dogmas, a guy named Peter Williams, he says that because you wouldn't use the ark to store ordinary things after storing the tablets and the manna and the, um, and the rod that had budded, you would never put normal stuff in there. Therefore, Mary wouldn't be used for ordinary births and child carrying after carrying Jesus. So you see why they want to establish this connection between Mary and the ark is to import the perpetual virginity of Mary into the text when it's really never there. They also import the bodily assumption with this ark analogy because in Revelation eleven nineteen, it says that John saw the ark of the covenant in heaven. So Mary's the ark, so Mary must have been taken up into heaven, bodily assumed. This is, this is offensively bad theology is what it is. The third one and the final one we'll do, I think it's the final one we'll do tonight, is that, that Mary's the queen mother. She's the queen mother, and this is sounds really good until you look at the details. Um, and don't get me wrong. Hey, man, if you show me in the scripture that says that Mary can intercede for me, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to pray to Mary. I trust God's holy word, okay? But this is the problem, is that when some, some of the Catholic teachings, when you try to get people who care about the scriptures, and I want it in the Bible kind of people, you know, when you try to get us on board, you start doing weird things. Um, so let's... We'll, we'll play clip seven in a second here. Um, but Solomon, Solomon's the son of David, Scott Hahn says, and therefore Jesus is the ultimate son of David. And just as Bathsheba was Solomon's mother, the queen mother, so Mary is the ultimate queen mother. And, um, and let's listen, to, listen for the reasoning. Listen for how he gets you 
there. And listen for the Catholic teaching about her interceding for you. Um, yeah, and then we'll talk about it. But what's so interesting to me, what I recall vividly studying as a Protestant, focusing upon the biblical record of David's kingdom, what really jumped off the page was a passage in 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 19. For there we see Solomon's mother going into the royal court, the royal chamber, where everybody bows before King Solomon, now that he is newly crowned, freshly anointed. When Bathsheba went to King Solomon to speak to him on behalf of Solomon's half-brother Adonijah, the king rose to meet her. And he bowed down to her. And then he sat on his throne and had a throne or a seat brought for the king's mother, and she sat on his right hand. And from that position, at the king's right hand, she gave to him royal petitions, not just from royal subjects, but from his own brethren who preferred to go through his mother rather than going directly to Solomon himself. So this sounds like this was a normal thing, right? Bathsheba, it was just known. Even his brothers, plural, brothers, brethren, would go through Bathsheba rather than to Solomon. And this was considered accepted. What is he implying? That, the, uh, that a Catholic person who says, I just like praying through Mary. Don't worry. Even Solomon's brothers went through Bathsheba. But let's look at that passage a little more carefully and see, is this, is this really saying Bathsheba interceded? Does this relate to Mary? Is it saying that Mary intercedes and that's okay? Well, let's look at it. Let's pretend that this is a picture about Mary. So 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 13. Just so you know, Adonijah was someone who wanted to steal the throne from Solomon. It's not considered a generally good thing to do. And um, that's the context. So <clears throat> 1 Kings 2, 13. Then Adonijah, the son of Haggith, came to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon. And she said, do you come peacefully? He said, peacefully. Then he said, I have something to say to you. She said, speak. He said, you know that the kingdom was mine and that all Israel fully expected me to reign. However, the kingdom has turned about and become my brother's for it was his from the Lord. So nice pious language there. It was his from the Lord. And now I have one request to make of you. Do not refuse me. She said to him, speak. And he said, please ask King Solomon, he will not refuse you, to give me Abishag the Shunammite as my wife, this woman who had lain with David to warm him in this rather interesting story. It makes us all feel slightly uncomfortable. Um, you're like, why did you guys do that? But, um, but anyways, he wants Abishag. Verse 18, Bathsheba said, very well, I will speak to you for the king. So here's the passage where, that Scott refers to where she goes and intercedes for Solomon's brethren, well, one brother, one time. Verse 19, so Bathsheba went to King Solomon to speak to him on behalf of Adonijah. And the king rose to meet her and bowed down to her. And she sat on his throne and he had a seat brought for the king. He sat on his throne, excuse me. That, was, uh, that would be good Catholic theology right there. Um, he sat on his throne and had a seat brought for the king's mother and she sat on his right. Then she said, I have one small request to make of you. Do not refuse me. And the king said to her, make your request, my mother, for I will not refuse you. And that is where all Catholics stop reading the passage. Because mm -hmm. if you keep reading, it kills the picture. But so far, oh yeah, you can go to Mary and she can influence Jesus for you. And it's, it's somewhat offensive uh, to me, to be honest, to think like that. But verse 21, she said, here's the request. Let Abishag the Shunammite be given to Adonijah, your brother, as his wife. King Solomon answered his mother, anything you, you want, mother, I will always bow to you because you are my great divine queen mother. No. What does he say to her? King Solomon answered his mother, and why do you ask Abishag, the Shunammite, for Adonijah? Ask for him the kingdom also, for he's my older brother, and on his side are Abiathar the priest and Joab the son of Zeruiah. So in other words, this is a coup. He's just trying to steal the throne and he's using you to manipulate me in order to get me to do that. And he's already promised, I'll, whatever you want, mom, I'll do it. But then after finding out what she wants, he says, then the, then the, verse 23, then King Solomon swore by the Lord saying, God do so to me and more also if this word does not cost Adonijah his life. Now therefore, as the Lord lives, who has established me and placed me on the throne of David, my father, and who has made me a house as he promised, Adonijah shall be put to death today. In the single example we have that's meant to be an example of Mary interceding for us, the guy who's doing the intercession through the picture of Mary is killed for it. 
this is not good typology, right? This is not consistent biblical typology. I, I say, please compare it to what I've given you the last 14 weeks. You know, um, this is not <clears throat> good biblical typology. Han acts like this is an office that was established that was healthy and good. The text seems to indicate that her, her intercession was rejected, it was manipulative, and it was the wrong way of doing things. <clears throat> no. The result, all you have to do is read, read the whole passage, right? He misquoted Genesis 3.15. He misapplies this passage right here. He just seems to consistently, he takes John and does all kinds of weird gymnastics with John 1 and 2 to try to say it's seven-day creation motif and all this stuff. Just read the passage and you'll be safe. You will be safe. There's more on the Queen Mother. Uh, I, actually, I do have a little bit of time because I gave myself extra time today. So, um, Let me give you another passage on the Queen Mother because he really, and a lot of Catholic apologists do this, they milk this Queen Mother concept because the Queen Mother was a big deal in the, in, back in the day, right? Because you had a, a king who potentially had multiple wives and whichever one of them would end up you know, having the son who became king, that was when she became the Queen Mother. Right? You weren't the queen mother until your son became king because it could have been any of those women who had the son who became king. So then you become the queen mother. And their statement is, you know, the queen mother is this institution. It's just part of reality. It's just, it's this good thing. But there's plenty of examples of bad queen mothers and more bad than good in the scriptures. For instance, 1 Kings 15, 13. Um, here's a queen mother uh, example as you look these up. Um, he also removed Ma'aka, his mother, from being queen mother because she had made an abominable image for Asherah and Asa cut down her image and burned it at the brook Kidron. So Asa, he removes her, he takes her out of her office and the reason is she made an Asherah image which Asherah is the queen of heaven image. So here are the queen mother making this queen of heaven image and she's removed from her place because of it. I'm telling you, Mariology is taking this beautiful, wonderful thing and then turning it into an idol, just like the bronze serpent. And they started worshiping this thing. This is not biblical. It's not true. And the violence they do to the scriptures to justify it is, is bad. Now, other Catholics will say, I don't care if it's in the Bible. We just trust the church. And I just say, at least you're being honest. <laughs> like, at least you're being honest about that. I do care if it's in the Bible and have no reason to trust the church over the scriptures on those issues. Other queen mothers I could give you examples of, like one you may have heard of named Jezebel. Probably the most famous queen mother example in the scriptures. Um, Athaliah, who kills her royal family and steals the throne till Jehoiada, the good guy, uh, has her killed and puts Joash in the rightful place. And so we have another queen mother here who tries to usurp the throne of, her, of uh, the actual rightful king. So these are not the best examples in all honesty. Now, did Mary have special authority in Jesus' ministry? Did, he did she have this intercessory role in Jesus' ministry? Well, in Luke 8, 19, we have Mary coming and petitioning Jesus for something she wants. It says, Then his mother and brothers came to him, but they could not reach him because of the crowd. And he was told, Your mother and your brothers are standing outside desiring to see you. So he knows my mom's out there. She wants to see me. But he answered them, My mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. Meaning that the motherly role that Mary had does not extend into the church in some sort of you know, spiritual authority position. Right? It's a beautiful thing. Like, I love my mom. And my mom doesn't have special rights at the church to, like, command things. And uh, it's just, it just doesn't apply. That's the thing. So this is how uh, Catholic.com, which is the Catholic Answers website, here's how they summarize the Queen Mother typology in their article called, Is Mary's Queenship Biblical? Let me read a quote to you. Understanding Mary as Queen Mother sheds light on her important intercessory role in the Christian life. Just like the Queen Mother of the Davidic kingdom, Mary serves as advocate for the people in the kingdom of God today. Thus, we should approach our Queen Mother with confidence, knowing that she carries our petitions with her, to her royal son and that, she and that he responds to her as Solomon did to Bathsheba. I will never refuse you. Of course, right after that, what did Solomon do? He refused her and killed the guy who made the request. This is abuse. This is just just hard, just full on abuse. And it happens not only in, I use Catholicism because it's just such a pervasive example. I was just looking for examples of this stuff. But it's used in Islam. They look for types of Muhammad. It's used in Mormonism. They look for types of Joseph Smith. It's used in the, the Mother God cult. I've covered a couple times, at least online, um, where they go, well, well, Jesus was rejected by the religious leaders and An Song Hong was rejected by the religious leaders. And I'm like, that's not a typology thing, man. Like, you're just making stuff up. 
So I would, it would be irresponsible if I didn't do this teaching to guard us against this sort of abuse. For instance, how many Old Testament types of Jesus are specifically and clearly identified in the New Testament? Like, I don't even have the number. I wonder what the number really is. But let me give you some examples. The bronze serpent, Jesus identified that, right? Jonah, Jesus identified that. The scripture in the New Testament clearly identifies a prophet unto Mo, or excuse me, a prophet like Moses, that Jesus is that prophet like Moses, that he's the tabernacle. I think that's not as clear, but I think that it's strong in there. And I shared that last week. Um, he's like Aaron, the high priest, read the book of Hebrews. He's like Melchizedek, the Melchizedekian priesthood. Um, he's like the rejected prophets from before in uh, both in the parables Jesus told, but also in Acts 7 and Stephen's address where he relates all these different rejected guys to Jesus. Um, as the ultimate one. He's called the new Adam. He's the word through whom creation comes in John 1. He is the true manna. He is the rock that was struck. He is the Passover lamp. These are all specific, clear identifications. How many clear identifications are there of Mary as, an, as a type in the Old Testament? Zero. I don't, now it doesn't bother me if they're there. I, I just want to be faithful to the text, right? I was faithful to the word of God. There's just none that I know of. And if they're there, if they are there, they don't give us new theology. You just look for a picture of what the New Testament has revealed. You're not creating new teachings. So the problem is, in this Catholic apologetic, and along with others who try to twist the Bible to try to pretend it teaches things that they believe that it just doesn't teach, they don't start with clear teachings, right? They don't use any New Testament identifications of types, and they conclude with new theology that never existed in the text in the first place. This is what cults do. This is what uh, Islam does. This is what Mormonism does as they try to, you know, when you look at the text and you say, I want to believe the Bible, but the stuff my, my people teach, I can't find it in there. Well, the last resort is to find a picture of it. And then you can say, well, it's not clearly taught, but it's implied. And you might say, well, Mike, isn't that the Trinity? Isn't it not clearly taught, but implied? No, it is clearly taught. That's the whole point. The Bible forces you into this doctrine. That's, that's the whole point is that it's clearly taught. If it was not clearly taught, then we should not hold, it, hold to it. You know, we should, if, if nothing else, just leave, leave the space blank. <laughs> As an, I don't know what it is. Um, so one rule will save you from all of this, and that is Old Testament types do not establish new unbiblical theology. You just can't get new theology from Old Testament types. There's, you know, there's one more clip. I don't know if, Kirk, if you can still bring it up. There's one more clip I wanted to play for you guys. I just forgot about it. But this clip, um, this, this clip is going to show you how extreme the conclusions of all these things. Once you bring in these dogmas of Mary, these four Mary dog, Marian dogmas, it starts to become very quickly this sort of idolatrous treatment of Mary, this like kind of like they did with the bronze serpent. So here's a clip from that same guy, Scott Hahn, as he got to the end of his whole spiel of all these pictures of Mary, so to speak, as he abused the scripture. Here's what he says, clip number six. This is our legacy. This is our lady. This is our mother. This is our queen. This is an integral and indispensable part of the kingdom of Jesus. You cannot have Jesus as king if you won't have Mary as queen. This is the gospel of the new covenant. This is what we find when we read the whole Bible, not just in proof texts, but in typology. This is why it matters. That's why it matters. That is nothing short of a false gospel. Nothing short of it. And it was used through finding vague, illegitimate pictures. And then at the end, he can go, when I was a, a, an anti-Catholic, ignorant Protestant, I thought I knew the Bible, but I didn't know about the pictures of Mary. And now I know the full gospel because I know the whole Bible and this nonsense. Um, it's, it's just offensive. There's a lot more I could cover. Um, there's a lot of other sort of, um, you know, common sense type of ways they try to smuggle some of this stuff in. They'll say like, well, um, who would want to go into the woman who had carried God, you know, for her perpetual virginity? And um, I'm like, that's just not how we do theology. You just don't do that. Um, like, would you, if you could make your mother sinless, wouldn't you? That's just 
not how we do theology. It's not. Um, uh, Jesus would honor his mother, right? The law says, Jesus, you know, you have to honor your parents. Well, Jesus isn't going to honor his mother more than any other woman in the world, so she'll get elevated to this divine, you know, queen mother, queen of heaven position. That's not how we do theology. This is how you just say random things and try to force us to believe theology that's not true. Just not true. So let's pray and then I'll take any questions or thoughts you guys may have. Um, Father, we thank you for your clear word and we pray that you give us the wisdom to just recognize when we're getting jerked around by bad theology and and rhetoric that's meant to uh, get us to believe things that are not based upon the scriptures clearly, but instead are based on someone's alien theologies to the scriptures, these alien theologies that are being forced into the word of God. We, we, we want to enjoy typology and seeing Jesus and seeing the gospel embedded in the pictures and things that are happening in the Old Testament, but we don't want to be gullible to those who might try to use those things to manipulate. So we pray for wisdom in Jesus' name. Amen.